Praise the Lord, saints. Good evening, everyone. God is good all the time. God is good. Thank you, Sister Winthrop. That song was an experience for me. Because when you talk about being marvelous, I know how wonderful my God is. You wouldn't understand how wonderful he is to me. You know, I've been talking since I came here. You will understand that I have been praying and fasting for my family this year. Am I saying that? And God has been blessing tremendously. He's a wonderful God. And, and, and tonight, you wouldn't understand, ladies and gentlemen, how happy I am to see all our visitors. All our first-time visitors. But in an extra special way, I am very happy to have in the congregation tonight my eldest brother. Amen. Amen. From mother and father. Amen. So please stand, Bill. Now you'd not understand why I'm so happy. You wouldn't understand why I'm so happy. This brother, this brother has been taking care of me. I could say us, but I'm just going to be selfish now. Taking care of me since I was seven. The death of my dad. He single-handedly took over the family. Are you hearing me? He bought me my first bicycle. All right? Helped me through high school. Stood by me through college. We have been so close that even when I was getting married, I had the audacity to tell him to buy me my soup. I'm telling you, and he bought me my suit to get married. Lord have mercy. I love you, Bill. And if I'm not mistaken, this could be the first time he's going to hear me preach. The second time. The second. So you can understand why I'm happy because God is marvelous. Answering the prayer. Because at this meeting, I've seen all my brothers in attendance. Amen. Amen? At this meeting. So we serve a mighty God. And I know that he is in the potter's hand. Are you with me? God is doing his wonderful works. His marvelous work. So tonight I'm overjoyed with that. And again, I just want to register and catalog my profoundest appreciation to you for the support you have been giving these meetings. Amen? Amen? It's marvelous to see you coming out night after night. You work hard and you're coming out and some of you are asking, can we go for another week? Hey, I have a sick wife in Orlando. I gotta go over there, you know? But God is good. It's a great, big, wonderful God. We have a special anointing service this evening. And a special request came to us, so we're going to kind of delay the anointing for, to meet that very special request. Amen? I mean, so we're going to kind of work it nicely because I believe and I'm expecting a miracle tonight. I'm expecting a miracle tonight. And so we're going to just acquiesce and just make sure that we, you know, give room for that special request for anointing tonight. So what we're going to do tonight, then we're going to go right into our question and answer. Not going to be very long uh, because we want to wrap up at a certain time by nine and um, the question and answer. But you have your burning questions and we want to entertain them. We want to get you to ask your question by the grace of God. Last night, what did we talk about? I prayed, Lord, I prayed for a mate and you gave me a snake. <laughs> that was the subject last night. The night before was the danger of favoritism. And Sunday night, we talked about how to divorce-proof your marriage. And last, uh, last week, we had a series of subjects that people are still asking questions. So who will be first tonight? You have a question for tonight. Question. Take in consideration the, the, the theme. It's all about relationship. Right. How will you tie that in with, say, someone decided to accept the Lord and keep his commandments 
And secondly, what will be the benefit or what is the benefit? Beautiful question. Beautiful question. Our theme is it's all about relationship. And he's asking how can we tie this theme into one on the verge of accepting Jesus Christ. Well, life begins with Christ. If you don't have Christ, you really don't have anything. But also, because of sin. Remember last night? Was it last night? I'm over 50. I'm entitled to forget. We talked about anywhere two people are, there is the potential for problem. Okay? And sin creates that. Now, God gives us rules to live by. Amen? Remember his question now. God gives us rules to live by. And so God gives us law. And even the creator God has the law that governs the universe. Or else planets would collide. Alright? So we have a rule. And it is called the Ten Commandments. So any Christian who wants to truly be pleasing to God, you have to live your life according to the Ten Commandments rule. Now, when you read and understand the Ten Commandments, the first four has to do with your relationship to God. And I call that the vertical relationship. When you read those four commandments, it has to do with your relationship with God. I'm talking about the man now who is about to become a Christian and, and totally dedicate your life to Jesus. But you see, your life is not just wrapped up and tied up with God. Your life is also wrapped up and tied up with your fellow man. And therefore, you have to live a life that exemplifies your relationship with your fellow man. And so the last six has to do with your relationship with your fellow man. And I call that your horizontal relationship. So there's the vertical relationship between you and God. And there is the horizontal relationship between you and your fellow man. That is the Ten Commandments. So anybody who says they're a Christian and don't want to obey the Ten Commandments, you are fooling yourself because I can quote you scripture from Genesis to Revelation that will prove to you that you have to keep the Ten Commandments. And I have come to realize that it's not that Christendom don't want to keep the Ten Commandments, it's just because they don't want to obey the Sabbath. You see, the Sabbath is a part of the Ten Commandments. It's right there. It is a fourth commandment that says, remember the, that you keep it holy. So that is what they're trying to get away from. But I have news for them. Because even in the scripture, let's go to the end. The end. Isaiah chapter 66 tells us that even in the end, when this earth is destroyed and recreated, you still have to be keeping the Sabbath. So you can't get away from it, brothers and sisters. There's no way you can get away from the Sabbath. Okay? So therefore, what's the bottom line is? Who is our example? Jesus. Jesus. And the Bible says, Jesus as his custom was. Notice, the scripture didn't say as the custom was. Because Jesus never committed himself to following customs. Okay? He was doing the right thing, not following customs. So the Bible didn't say as the custom was, but as his custom. What was his custom? He went to church on the Sabbath day. So Jesus was a Sabbath keeper. And he, Jesus would never keep the Sabbath to suit people. He was keeping it because it was right. He was keeping it to set an example for us. So it became his custom. 
And that is, if you want to have a relationship with Christ, you need to understand that Jesus Christ is our example. So you've got to live as he lived. You've got to worship as he worshiped if you want to have and maintain a relationship with him. And lastly, he was perfect. Amen. Never sinned. So he knew that there would be some people in Lighthouse tonight who would be procrastinated with their baptism. And so Jesus wanted to make sure that nobody fools you so he went to his cousin John and said, John, baptize me. But because Jesus is the sinless Lamb of God, John says, no, I am not baptizing you. You need to baptize me. I am the sinner. You are the sinless one. And it's like, put it in my word, Jesus says, shut up, John. Just do it now. In other words, in Bible language, it says, suffer it to become it so that you fulfill all righteousness. So Jesus was baptized not because of sin, but to set an example for us. So, can, so anybody who says, I don't want to be baptized and you want to be a follower of Christ, you are listening to another spirit and not the Holy Spirit. Amen? And so if you want to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, then you have to walk as he walked. Live as he lived. And of course, you will be in communion with him. Thank you very much, Elder. God bless you. Any other question tonight? Pretty much answer your question. Praise the Lord. God bless you. Question at the back. Well, I'm not at the back, but I'm right here. And Pastor, why did the, the, the Bible call the Holy Spirit a person? Um, you have Father, Son. Could you explain to us, because the Holy Spirit omnipresent is everywhere, and a person can't be everywhere at the same time. Okay. And why did he call him a masculine gender? Okay. Can somebody read John 16, 13? John 16, 13. That text is jumping out at me. I don't have my Bible here. John chapter 16 and verse 13. John chapter 16 and verse 13. John 16, 13. Give her a mic so that she can read it with the microphone. Here you are. Okay, go ahead. John 16, 13 says, How be it when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Okay, so you notice the Bible writer didn't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. It, right. it is new to gender. Mm? It is new to gender. So when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he is a person. The Holy Spirit is not a force. The Amen. Holy Spirit is not an influence. The Holy Spirit is a person. And therefore, you can't grieve a force. You can't grieve an influence. So the Bible teaches us that grieve not the Holy Spirit. All right? Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So therefore, the Holy Spirit is a person, is the third person of the Godhead. And Jesus, the Son of God, worked with the Holy Spirit to create the universe to create this world he's a person so when you're praying you are praying through to through the holy spirit to the godhead to god the father amen i could go on and on yet for time okay amen last question go ahead yes um back to elder thompson question about the ten commandments there are those in the world and you know, denominations, you know, Sunday, keeping denominations, and even those in our church that believe that we cannot keep those commandments, those Ten Commandments. But Scripture let us know that if we put on the whole, you know, the garment of Christ, His righteousness, that we can keep all Ten Commandments okay. by putting on His garments. And also it is said, you know, back to 
keeping the Ten Commandments. Men believe and feel that we cannot have victory over sin. That sin will always remain until Jesus returns. And I'm not talking about just in the world, but I'm talking about in an individual. But if we are Christians and we are claiming to be Christ-like in his garments, then we can have victory over sin. Amen. Correct? Amen. Amen. Uh, you, you didn't really ask a question, but you explained right. along the line. And I, I agree with you all the way, except that I just need to expand a little that a person outside of Jesus Christ cannot keep the commandments. Okay? And that's why you have to come to Christ. It's Christ is going to give you the strength. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So, so when people look at you and say, you can't keep the commandments, don't argue with them. Don't even try to be defensive. Because there is some truth in that. So what you need to do is to say, you are correct. I can't keep the commandment, but because I have given my heart to Jesus, he helps me to keep it. Do you understand? And so you have to understand that because sometimes you can turn off people who believe that this, you really can't do this. And you're fine. Yes, I can. No, you can't. Except for Christ. So we need to understand that. Amen? Is Jesus Christ going to help you to keep his commandments? Amen? His commandments. May God bless you tonight. As we go into tonight's message, where are the men? Pray with me. Great God and our compassionate Father, we thank you for the evidences of your Holy Spirit's presence in these meetings since we began. We thank you for the fact, Lord, that your people are so encouraged. They have even braved the weather last week and came out in their numbers. We are so thankful. We thank you for those who have been voicing and, and testifying of the breakthrough they have been getting in their marriages, in their family lives, and in their relationships. Thank you, dear God. Now, Lord, as we enter into another message tonight, where are the men? A question that we need answer for. We invoke now the presence of your Holy Spirit to be with us again and to continue to manifest himself with us. Speak through me one more time to the hearts of your listening people. And as I speak forth your words of truth and life, may self be crucified and may Jesus Christ and him only be lifted up and seen. Let the church say, Amen. Where are the men tonight? All right, it's a question. Where are the men? Where are they? Well, Adam, the Hebrew word in general means man. It is a generic term for humanity. But specifically, it means Adam, the first human created by God. Amen? All right. What was man's response? What did Adam say to God? There was a conversation. You see, stay with me tonight. God created Adam and gave him Eve. Now I'm not going to go into that part because we have dealt with that last week. Adam loved Eve. God, every day in the evening time, would come and talk with Adam and Eve. One day, something happened. And God had to call out for man more than once. And I wanted to go home and read that story in your spare time. Because when God called out to man, not only did he not answer immediately, but he went in hiding. Adam, where art thou? Adam, have you done something wrong? 
What have you done? Watch this. Watch this. Adam knew he had done something wrong. Adam was a man. And for the first time in history, we begin to see the weakness of a man that is manifesting itself up to today. Adam, the man, was not big enough to own up to his responsibility. Adam, when God says, what have you done? Adam started the blame game. It's the woman whom you have given to me. Let's move on. Adam could not say, Father, I messed up. Father, I sinned. He knew very well what he had done, but he resorted to blame Eve. And that's one of the sins of today where man refuses to claim responsibility for his own action. One of the bitter fruits of sin is hardness of heart. Without natural affection, Romans 1, 31. Remember we talked about it's not Adam and Steve or Eve and Yvette. It's Adam and Eve because God made them male and female. But sin came. And so man is gravitating towards man. Where are the men? They have lost a sense of their personhood. They no longer know who they are. They are mixed up and confused. Let's move on. Where are the men? Instead of digging in the books, you are cooling out shrinking back when you should be stepping forward today there is a shortage of men let me share with you some staggering statistics the united states statistics let's go back these statistics are confined to the black race and compiled from 2002 onward let's move 60 percent of all African American are functionally illiterate. Sixty percent functionally illiterate. Thirty-five percent unemployed. Seventy percent of all black men will be unemployed by 2006 to 2012. 80% of the total prison population will be black men. Where are the men? 33% huh. of all black families live below poverty line. In one day, 2,989 children see their parents get divorced. And if you listen to the news just last Friday, the president was talking about this. And he made a statement concerning the youth, African-American youth. We are in trouble. I think we are on top of the list of endangered species. We're about to be wiped out. And the devil is a part of it. The devil is a part of it. Some of us have to hold two jobs to make ends meet. The middle passage did not kill us. Slavery did not wipe us out. So where are the men? Where are the men? If we were, our ancestors were strong enough to survive the middle passage. They were strong enough to survive slavery. What trick is the devil playing now? What tricks? In South Africa, during the time of apartheid, the black man spent more than six months underground 
mining gold. They still do that today. So what do you think happened to the family when the father, the house band, is away? The family stretches and sag like poor fabric. Statistics have shown that by the year 2050, if left alone, black males in particular will be extinct because of crime and violence. It seems to me that there's a plan to eliminate us. Black males between the ages of 18 to 29 are in jail. They are on probation or they are dead. They are dead. It's time we recognize what we are up against and come up with our own survival package. Every church needs to do that. But you know why we are not doing it? Because we don't understand that there is power in togetherness. So all I do, I take my two boys and I warn them, don't get in trouble. And I don't care about anybody else. That must stop. Because we are strong when we combine our efforts. We are strong. Amen. And so there are forces out there. Folks have not changed. There is still thick prejudice in this culture. You will be all right just working. You will be okay just collecting your paycheck. But don't strive for the top position. You will be eliminated. Does that mean you don't strive? Well, I serve a God who says... You must be the head and not the tail. So therefore, don't because of fear or afraid of anybody else, you're going to settle for mediocrity. Aim for the best. The best that you can be. But we do have a problem. We don't know how to be the best and be humble at the same time. And so, relationship has to be taught. We have got to understand, how can I make straight A's in school and the whole class don't have to know about it? You've got to understand that. Because evil is everywhere. We have got to get back to basis and teach our children how to survive in a society that is vile and unfriendly. You've got to teach them those skills. We owe it to ourselves and we owe it to them. The statistics says that blacks represent 12% of the population. Watch this. Blacks represent 12% of the population, but accounts for 45% of all arrests. In the minority, but in the majority in prison. More than 40% of the total murder victims in the country are blacks. And nearly 95% of all homicides are perpetrated by blacks. Why? Why is the question tonight? Because black men are not equipping themselves to make it in the society. Folks, when you go to the different classes in the colleges today, 
percent male, two percent blacks. I am I'm giving you the real truth. The classes are filled with women and 10% male, white and black, but of the 10%, 2% blacks. Something is wrong. Something is wrong. And I am saying tonight that it's time we stop hitting our black brothers over the head and try to find out the real problem. The real problem. And I believe, I believe that churches have the answer. Churches have the answer. You've got to make a paradigm shift. You can't just prepare people for heaven without the understanding that you cannot go to heaven unless you live successfully on earth. So a part of the preparation package must be to prepare people how to live successfully on earth. That's why we're coming up with these job opportunities. Because a lot of our black brothers are giving up. They are losing hope. There are jobs out there, you know, folks. There are jobs out there, but they are not preparing themselves for these jobs. And we are sitting back. We are folding our hands. And we are watching the brothers disappear into oblivion. Lose hope. Lose faith, gone forever. When will we recognize that we can change this? We cannot just change it by talking. We need validation, empowerment, and encouragement. Three words that are gone out of our vocabulary. Validation, empowerment, and encouragement. Oh, we get a lot of cursing. Call you worthless. You're not going to come out to anything good. You go into a store, you are marked. They watch you through a mirror when you don't even realize. Your very color marks you down 50%. Folks, you've got to get real because we can succeed because we were born to triumph we were born to triumph but there is a special route to go we have got to get out of the grasshopper mentality there's a bible story talks about the children of Israel. God told them that the land was theirs. God said it. God said it. And they came close to the land. And the leader said, you know something, before we go over there, I'm going to send 12 of you men on what is called an espionage mission. It's a spy mission. I'm going to send 12 to go and check this out. Watch this. 12 men went to check out what God said was already there. <laughs> All right? Uh, they didn't need to do that. There was no need for them to do that. Because that's showing doubt. God said it's already there. I'm going to give you a land flown with milk and honey. And, and he said, okay, go guys, go and check this out. So they went. Twelve of them went. And everything that God said was there. In the story, God didn't describe the people. He described the land. 
but they came back focusing on the people. God says, I'm going to give you the land, and this is how the land is. Go and possess it. They went to spy out the land, saw with their own eyes everything that God has said, shifted their intention and attention from what God said and put it on something else. So they came back, and watch this. They went to spy out the land. God gave them the unction to function, and they came back, and they started to report Ten of them had the same report. And all of a sudden, somebody used an interjection. And they came in with the word, but. But. They were given a positive story. Then they shifted the emphasis and say. But the land is flowing with milk and honey. The grapes are big. Look, we have brought back samples. But the land is filled with giants. We can't possess it. God says it's yours. And there's always a danger when you're listening to a good story. And you hear the interjection. But. That which is to come is devastating. It didn't stop there. Watch this now. They started to put down themselves. I am saying to you tonight, watch this. Our problem is not necessarily the society. The problem is in our minds. Because those men started to see themselves as grasshoppers. If you see yourself as grasshopper, you're going to think like grasshopper. You're going to act like grasshopper. And when you should be standing up, you're crawling like grasshoppers. They felt that they were like grasshoppers. And the grasshopper mentality continues. Sometimes you can achieve big things, but you're rather just mediocre. Anything I'm doing for God, I am planning big. Amen. It may end up small, but I'm not guilty of planning small. I'm going to plan big. Because you see, I'm not planning to get the praise of men or to pat myself on the shoulder. I'm not looking for accolades. I am giving God the glory. Yes. Plan big. God says you will possess the land. It's yours. Then if he tells you that you're supposed to be the head and not the tail, God tells me that all I do every day, look myself in the mirror. Lord, am I obedient to you? Am I doing what you says? Well, just take it by faith. So there are some contributing factors why we are as we are. And trust me, brothers and sisters, it is by design. What is happening to us is by design. It's planned. One of them is the media. The media, the typical teenager watches at least 15,000 hours of television and actively participates in 18,000 murders. They spend 70% of their time in front of the television. Economics, unemployment is three times higher among black youth. I'm going to wrap this up quickly because we have the anointing service. Let's go quickly. Jesus is saying to us tonight, I was Adam's tree of life. I was Abraham's faith. I was Isaac's hope. I was Moses' rock. I was Gideon's courage. I was Elijah's wheel in a wheel. Let me be your savior. Trust me. Trust me. Close your eyes and walk with me. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, as we enter into the anointing service tonight, 
there are some things that you need to understand. And I need you to understand it because it's important for you to understand. God wants you to exercise the ABC of prayer. Ask. Ask. Believe. And claim it. Amen? Ask. Believe. And claim. Can you do that tonight? Ask, believe, and claim. You can read in your spare time Mark 11, 22 through 26. If you don't believe, don't get up. Amen? Oh, you're going to experience a miracle tonight but don't do it for formality do it because deep in the inner recesses of your heart you believe that God is going to do something special for you so I'm going to ask you to stand right where you are those who believe and you're going to ask and you're going to claim And we're going to do this a little differently tonight. I'm going to ask the pastor to stand right in the front here with the oil. And you're going to filter out of your pews. And you're going to come for that special anointing tonight. And claim the promise. We're going to pray over this oil tonight. The transforming power of the Holy Spirit. Ask, believe, and claim it tonight. Let us bow our heads. Great God and our Heavenly Father, through your Holy Writ, we've learned that if there's any among us who is sick, let them call for the elders of the church. Uh, let them pray over the sick and anoint that sick with oil because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Tonight, remind us one more time that we have the power, we have access to the weapon of prayer. Teach us how to use it, Lord. We don't have to enter into any fanfare. We don't have to shout at you, oh Lord, because you want us to talk to you as we do a friend. And your ears are not stopped so you can't hear us. Your hands are not short so you can't reach down to us. All we need to do is to reach you by faith. So tonight, Lord, we present this oil to you and ask that you will transform it into the healing balm that it can become and as your people filter out of their pews and walk down this aisle and to be anointed may they return to their pews and their seats as victors and overcomers because Daniel's God is present here tonight yes, and he surely will deliver in Jesus name Amen